Sometimes we can miss things that are hidden in plain sight. When I was a kid with my brother on holidays, we'd play that game in the car, I spy with my little eye. I'm sure you've played it, or your kids have. For me and my brother, we could see something that began with the letter E that my parents could not. They might have, they might have just been playing along with us, but for me and my brother, it seemed so obvious. But my parents just didn't see it. When we looked tonight at this passage from Revelation chapter 22, we have to ask ourselves the question, first of all, what is that last book of the Bible all about? The answer? We have to be pointed to the things we could so easily miss. The book of Revelation asks us again and again to really look and really behold and really see what history is all about. The book begins with this verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God has shown to his servants what must soon take place. And almost the last verse says, These words are trustworthy and true, for the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. The beginning of the book and the end of the book point out that his servants have to be shown what history is all about. And you, like many during COVID over the last few years, have been asking the question, what's the point of it all? Where's history going? Is there any grand plan? COVID has so undermined our sense of security that we're all going somewhere worthwhile. What's history all about? God is building a city. That's what history is about. God is building a city. The Bible begins with a garden, the Garden of Eden, but the Bible ends with a city. Through the course of history, God has achieved something. God has done something. God has built something. In Revelation chapter 21, just a few verses before the reading we had tonight, we read, The angel showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. God gives to us this gift of a city. It's not made by us. It's made by him. God is building a city. Cities are the places where we celebrate the highest achievements of humankind. Cities are the places where we can enjoy the fruits of our labour. Cities are places of structure and organisation, not wild, but cultivated. It was so weird during the pandemic to see the streets of Melbourne deserted. That's not the way cities are supposed to be. A field in the countryside, deserted of people, can look beautiful. But a city, deserted of people, that's frightening. Cities are for people. God is building a city. God's building a city for his people to live in. It's a strange city, though, as we heard read, because in this city, a river flows through it from God's throne. The river flows down the main street. And alongside that river, which is kind of like the main street, an orchard is growing with fruit for sustenance and leaves for healing. This city 
which God is building for his people is kind of like a garden as well. You might have seen photos of that temple in Cambodia, Angkor Wat, where old buildings now have trees growing through them, having taken deep root under the walls growing out. The old buildings are in decay and the trees are taking over. But it's the opposite here in Revelation chapter 22. The buildings are growing out of the garden, the Garden of Eden. God is building a city. The Bible begins with the garden, but it ends with this glorious vision of the city of God. He's building a city for his people, for those who trust in Christ. We're warned just the verse before our passage Into that city, nothing unclean will enter, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. God's building a city for his people, for those who've trusted in Christ. And it's going to be way better than the Garden of Eden could ever be. As we read in 22.3, Nothing cursed will be found there anymore. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. The Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads. God's building a city not just because we need accommodation. He's not building a city to offer us a range of restaurants and galleries. He's building a city so that he can live with us. So that we can be so close to him that we see his face. All through the Bible storyline, human beings were not allowed to see God's face. But here, finally, when the city is complete, we will see his face. God will live with his people forever and ever. The whole point of history, the goal of history, is that we will see Jesus. As John writes elsewhere, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. But what we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. The goal of history is not merely that God makes a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation. God makes a new creation so that we can live with him there eternally and intimately and permanently. The goal is not just a new world, but the goal is a new world in which we can live with God. Intimately. And when we see him face to face, he writes his name on our forehead. We belong to him. Is there anything better in the whole world than knowing that we belong to Jesus Christ? Just like at baptism, when you're signed with the sign of your cross, of the cross on your forehead to show that we are marked as Christ's own forever, so on that day he will mark his name on our head, for which baptism is a distant symbol or sign. What's the purpose of history? Well, God is building a city, and the center of the city is Christ himself 
There's no temple in that city that God is building. In the Old Testament, God made himself available in the tabernacle or the temple. But we learn in verse 22 that there is no temple in that city. There are no priests, no sacrifices, no lamps, because we have the thing to which the priests and the sacrifices and the lamps pointed, Jesus Christ himself. He is the lamp of that temple who gives light to the whole world. There's no need for sacrifices when we finally take up our dwelling place with Jesus Christ in that great city. We learn in verse 2 that there's a tree of life in that city with 12 kinds of fruit producing fruit each month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. But interestingly, the word that John uses for tree is not the normal word. John has chosen a different word, a word that's normally used to describe a dry tree, a cut-down tree, a stick or a cudgel. It's the same word that's used for the cross on which Christ died. Christ died on a tree. He died on a cross. We don't need sacrifices in heaven because Jesus Christ himself through his death on the cross, gives to us everything we need to be completely satisfied for the healing of the nations. Friends, the gospel that Christians preach is magnificent news for the whole world. We want to tell the world that Jesus is the lamb who takes away our sins that we might be forgiven. We want to tell the world that Jesus is the light overturning the darkness inside us and around us. We want to tell the world that Jesus is the living water for from his throne flows a river of life-giving refreshment. We want to tell the world that Jesus Christ is the King sitting on the throne, calling all people to repent and worship him alone. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. This is good news. And I'm so glad you're here this afternoon to hear these precious words read from the scriptures. One of the most famous Christian preachers of all time was a man in the 19th century named Charles Spurgeon. He has this reflection on this passage. There is no light in the planet but that which proceedeth from the sun. And there is no true love to Jesus in the heart but that which cometh from the Lord Jesus himself. From this overflowing fountain of the infinite love of God, all our love to God must spring. This must ever be a great and certain truth that we love him for no other reason than because he first loved us. Yes, we want to praise God today for all that's beautiful in creation but we also praise him above all for our saviour, Jesus Christ, and for the hope of sharing in his glory. Amen.